University of Dallas in Texas, and yes. you survived. This is Waswell X Waswell, Evil O, coming to you once again from Udaipur. And before I go any further, I have to do my usual. Please like and subscribe, like and subscribe. It helps the channel grow. YouTube circulates it more in their algo algorithms if you like and subscribe. So please do that. Leave a comment, say something. Their comments are always welcome. So, anyway, Today we're speaking with somebody who I first became aware of when I went to Jaipur. I went to the JKK in Jaipur and saw an exhibition and I saw this huge wall full of plates, I think it was. And I noticed, I really liked it. And I noticed the artist's name was Rahul Kumar. Didn't know him at the time. We later became friends. We met in Bangkok one time when he was there with his wife. And we ended up going to a restaurant called Eat Me for lunch, which only in Bangkok can you find a restaurant called Eat Me. And we had a great lunch there. And um, so anyway, Rahul is a ceramicist, but he's much more than that. He is a writer. He writes for Stir World. He writes for a lot of magazines. He is a consultant to Arts Illustrated, I believe. He can tell us this later, but mostly we want to talk about his ceramics. So without further ado, here is Rahul Kumar. How are you today? Good morning, Vasco, and uh, I'm very well. Thank you so much for having me uh, with you on this wonderful edition of Evil O, uh, and uh, you know, a channel that I've been following for quite some time. So very, very happy to be here today with you. So anyway, I want to get into first your personal work, because you are a Kumar. But I think Kumar is spelled differently if they're actually of the caste that does pottery. I think you explained right. that to me in Bangkok. But um, you do fabulous ceramic work. So why don't you talk a little bit about how you got into ceramics and what attracted you to that medium? Sure. Well, um, that would take me back almost 24, 25 years, actually. Um, I was, I think I was about 17 when I first, you know, got attracted to clay as a medium. And um, uh, I was in school and uh, K.S. Radhakrishnan, the, uh, the sculptor uh, who makes these wonderful bronze uh, uh, sculptures, was the sculpture teacher in, uh, in my school then. Um, and uh, he was quite a terror, right? Uh, he, he, he's, he doesn't seem to be that anymore at all, but he was quite a terror back in school. Uh, so he I was a strict teacher. Oh, he was a very strict teacher and people were really scared of him. Good, uh, we need those. Well, I, I agree, I, I, I completely agree. And I think that's what I've taken on uh, when I teach myself, you know, the strictness uh, and, and, you know, the whole um, respect to the process and medium, etc. So, uh, yeah, that's, I mean, I'm, I'm just uh, remembering of how he was, but uh, he, was, he was a fantastic teacher. So I didn't really take his classes more regularly or seriously in school, but I got, I got attracted to the medium, you know, the tactile quality of clay then. Um, but it was only after finishing my school that I seriously even started learning uh, uh, clay and and within that, as maybe the case uh, with almost all clay practitioners, uh, you begin with uh, pottery and you begin with throwing on the wheel. Um, you know, and it's pretty much the case that happens uh, uh, across the world. Unless you're doing very serious sculpting, you really begin the learning process to learn to make pots on the wheel. Uh, so it wasn't very different for me. I started with uh, uh, throwing and, and making functional utilitarian works. Um, so that really was the genesis, uh, you know, and I, and I started learning uh, with, uh, uh, in, in Delhi Blue Pottery, which is, which is a ceramic school in Delhi. 
but I had the fortune of actually learning with uh, an amazing uh, uh, artist uh, in her own right and uh, today, uh, that is Dipali, Dipali Garos. Um, and uh, Dipali's now husband, uh, PR Garos, you know, would also visit us very often. So, you know, I really owe, owe, the, owe it to them for the, um, for the initial foundation uh, of, of aesthetics. Uh, and and even even the technicalities, uh, you know, because when you're talking clay and ceramic practice, there's a lot of technical stuff that goes alongside, or maybe even comes before um, any aesthetics or anything more, right? You just need to know how to handle the material, the glazing, the firing. So um, yes, so I, I really, you know, I spent some time in the personal studio of uh, PR Daros, and uh, that that really put me on the path of, uh, path of clay. Uh, my mother, my magical mother, one of the things she did, her many things she did, she took ceramic classes oh, in the wow. suburbs of Milwaukee and they had a kiln and everything. And like you said, she started with forming pots and forming yes. dishes. And But I just remember how involved she would get with the glazing of them and everything and the firing and you know, she always told me stories about how much, how labor intensive it was and how you had to really know your materials and be in contact with your materials. Um, yes. So I kind of grew up hearing all of those stories. But how did your art, like you consider yourself a fine artist now, you don't consider yourself a craftsman. Yes, and that uh, was something uh, that, that, yeah, that's, that's a sort of a, a good question at this point, I'd say. Um, so I did learn to make uh, pots and what was most challenging at that time was to make a bowl that was comfortable to eat from or a pitcher that would pour well without dripping uh, the beverage and things like that. You know, the functionality. Uh, well, was I'm so I, I'm going to interrupt you. I'm so glad you brought that up because I stayed in many cheap hotels in my life and one of my prime complaints is they give you these little stainless steel pitchers of coffee and they're absolutely impossible to pour without coffee going all over the place and I'm <laughs> always like whoever designed this should just burn in hell <laughs> the evil O <laughs> so absolutely. That, design, that design is important you know no I, I, yeah exactly and you know uh, so therefore and, and, and that's exactly uh, the point, right? So what was most important uh, were, I guess, two things, the, uh, the skill of, of creating the wear and of course, handling it through the firing, et cetera. But the design of it really, you know, started becoming of primary importance. Now, as much as I respect both the craft and the design, uh, there was a deep desire to say more with, uh, with you know, with the, with the medium of clay and the subject of part. And I felt um, incapable of sort of not equipped to, to be able to express through, through that work, right? And, and, and that's where I realized uh, the importance and need for art education. Uh, you know, the idea of being able to say more with what you do and, and really tell a story is something that, uh, that I just wasn't aware how to. And- uh, were, you, were you at, when you were making pots, and played. Were you trying to tell stories or narratives through your designs or anything at that point? Or um... yes, uh, you know the way it started, literally, uh, and it, and it sort of may sound funny now. Uh, I started uh, giving titles to my pots, right? Huh. Uh, you know, if it's a, if it's a very very nicely bellied pot with a tiny little neck and a small mouth, and you know the way I glazed it. Uh, I called it dew drops, right? So that was, I would say, you know, one step forward uh, where there is more to the work than what meets the eye. And, and title, uh, you know, is sort of an indication that I'm giving as to what emotion I want to evoke from my viewer. Uh, you know, so there was this desire and constant push to go in that direction. And uh, uh, let me tell you, this was... Pretty much now, by, by now, I was around 10 years into being a potter, uh, 2005, six. Uh, you know, I wasn't really going and seeing a lot of art exhibitions. So I wasn't introduced to fine art uh, like that. Uh, you know, I was pretty heads, heads down 
with my medium and the process. I, I find that so hard to believe because now you're like a, somebody you always run into at an art opening in Delhi. You're always there. I mean, you make the scene, which I think is wonderful. <laughs> but well, you're aware uh, of what's going on, you know. Yeah, I, art is home now, and it's been a it's been a long journey. Uh, you know, for me, art was something that I wasn't familiar with at all. So I had no idea what more I can do. Uh, you know, by sitting on the wheel, making a pot, which will always, you know, be symmetrical round, uh, you know, the function of being, uh, being thrown on the wheel. Uh, you know, I, I started doing certain things to it, but all sort of, you know, very uh, hesitant, uh, hesitantly moving in that direction uh, with no guidance and understanding of what could happen, right? Uh, and that's when uh, I decided to, uh, you know, both get Western education and as well as uh, formal art education. Uh, I certainly didn't have any, any, any way to fund that myself. And I ended up applying uh, uh, to uh, Fulbright, uh, Fulbright uh, to get a Fulbright scholarship. And uh, 2006 is when I got the scholarship. Um, and although I, I planned for it to be a short three month or a six month course or a an experience more than even a course, it, you know, I ended up getting a full grant for a master's program. And that's wow. how, um, yeah, it was, it was absolutely uh, one of the most enriching experiences I, I, can, I can definitely say it was. Um, and I ended up choosing University of Dallas in, in Texas, uh, you know, with the good thing about- no, I didn't, wait, wait, I didn't know that. You went to the University of Dallas in Texas? Mm -hmm. And yes. you survived and you got home alive. Well, uh, don't forget, I lived in, in Gurgaon, uh, which is in Haryana. So a lot of similarities there. We had Yeah, yeah, there are actually. Air, right? Yeah. So a uh, lot of similarities, right? Um, but yes, it, it was wonderful. It was really, really nice. And for me to choose uh, a University of Dallas was less about Texas or even the university. It was really the... Uh, chair of the program, uh, you know, I, I really admired his work. And uh, he was more of an educator. Uh, you know, he was a good artist, uh, but also an educator. And that was important for me, because uh, mind you, this was the first time ever that I was stepping out to get formal art education. So it was important for me to be with someone who's not just a good artist, maybe, I mean, I'd be happy with, you know, a, a not the best artist, but I definitely wanted uh, the idea of uh, education to be to be primary. Uh, you know, so uh, uh, I ended up actually getting in touch with Val Cushing. He's a uh, he's a, a you know national treasure for for the U.S. Has really contributed a lot uh, for ceramics. Uh, Val retired and he wasn't teaching anymore, so he guided me to one of his uh, sort of favorite students. Uh, who was the chair of the art department in University of Dallas uh, called Dan Hammett. So uh, I, I, uh, I ended up uh, doing a master's program with a concentration in ceramics, but this is pretty much also the first time I learned, uh, you know, art history and uh, uh, obviously a little bit about printmaking, sculpture, painting, just all of it, uh, you know, was really the first time I, I was experiencing that. Well, people don't realize, but Dallas is actually a pretty nice city. I was only there once. I certainly went rated in my top 10 or even my top 100, but it's a much nicer city than people might imagine. And they do have a very big connection with art. There's sculptures all over the city that I remember, and they've got some nice museums and, um, there's, there's kind of a, an art sensibility in Dallas, I think, would you say? Oh, absolutely. Uh, and and uh, I, 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 I was lucky to be in, in Dallas Fort Worth area as a sport because there's the Kimball, there is, there is, uh, uh, there are, there's a Dallas Museum of Art, uh, there's a sculpture, Nasher, Nasher Sculpture Park. So there are so many of these. And at the Kimball especially, uh, I mean, for the first time ever, I saw uh, Cezanne works and Henry Matisse's works. You know, uh, I always read about or, or sort of saw Mondrian paintings, uh, but that's the first time I actually saw a Mondrian and, and took a right. self. You know, so it was uh, uh, Jackson Pollock is again, you know, they would always have these traveling shows 
they would end up coming to Dallas and, you know, all the students would get together and make it a point uh, to go there. Uh, students were allowed for free. In fact, they were also given, uh, you know, two coupons to get, uh, get beer. Uh, so we would, you know, really have a fantastic time. Uh, I was really living the uh, university uh, environment, but also getting out of the university and doing a lot of these things. Um, you know, so it, it really, it really was a wonderful time. And uh, for someone who had the desire to learn about the arts and had, had never, ever done, I, again, this was the master's program and I never, I never did bachelor's in arts. I, I did an MBA before that, right? Uh, you know, so I was really coming from, a, you know, point zero to all of the stimulation that I got uh, being there. Uh, so you can just imagine how, what it meant for me. Well, yeah, I remember when I was in Dallas, and this is a long time ago, but I remember a sculpture of wild horses sort of galloping through the city made of bronze. Uh, Irving, you know? Irving, that's in Irving. Exactly. Yeah, that really caught my attention. It was like, that's pretty impressive. La, you know. Las, Las Colinas is a place in Irving, and I absolutely remember that very distinctly. You yeah. know, so the whole city had these sort of spread around things for you to discover. Um, you know, it was, it was a wonderful experience. So you came back to India. Did, uh, you, buy, did you bring back a cowboy hat? Uh, I did, as a matter of fact. Uh, <laughs> I did bring a cowboy hat. Uh, I ate steaks there. Uh, okay. pretty much the first time I ate beef. Um, and when I came back and told my grandmother that I ate beef, she was very upset, didn't speak to me for a few days. Uh, and then I tried to explain, I said, you know, I ate the American cow. Indian cow is holy, not American. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. But that didn't help. But finally, she did, she did forget the fact that I ate beef. Um, yes, and I came back. Uh, I came back after completing my master's program. Uh, you know, our entire thesis, a thesis exhibition had to be put up. All of that was really wonderful. You know, back in India, and again, it's, it's sort of comparison, not, not that I'm complaining, any is better than the other. But uh, in the master's program there, uh, you know, when I'm putting up the thesis exhibition, it's not just the work and the conceptual reference. I had to make my own pedestals. I had to choose my own gallery, right? And in the oral defense, it was, uh, you know, everything was questioned. Why the height of pedestal? Why the paint on pedestal? What are you keeping it against? What is it juxtaposed against? You know, all of that was something, uh, you know, putting an exhibition up, designing the card, not just title of the exhibition, putting the wall text. There was, abs it was all part of the program to do it by yourself. You know, uh, we don't do that in India. Uh, I, I don't know whether we educate our people like that because I've never been to an Indian art uh, uh, institution. But, uh, you know, at least doing that once uh, gave me and empowered me a lot uh, with, with, you know, what's to be done, uh, even if I'm getting it done through others now. Um, but yeah, that, you know, the most important thing was uh, being equipped to, to be able to express with uh, not just the medium of clay, but also the subject of pot. Uh, and that was 2009 when I, when I came so so when you came back, I mean, when did the shift happen? Was there like one piece? Was there like a point where it was like, this is no longer just a dish. This is no longer just a pot. This has become a sculpture. Oh, yes, absolutely. And that yeah. shift, uh, yes. And, you know, for, for almost about six years, seven years after I came back, uh, the idea of, uh, still retaining the vessel form, but make it a work of sculpture uh, is something that I challenged myself with. You know, up until 2016, I was actually still orienting myself around the vessel form. But it was, it was not meant to be used as a dish or as a pot. Uh, it would be very impractical to put it to any function. Um, but yes, and then gradually I started to, you know, put the whole idea of vessel behind me. And now my work has pretty much nothing to do with vessel uh, 90% of the time. Do you, want to, do you want to just briefly describe, you know, you know, give the title and describe some of the works you've done and, and why they were important to you? 
Sure. Uh, you know, one of the series that I, uh, that I in, in another video I spoke about recently, it's called Harmonic Discord. Um, it, it was actually, uh, the idea germinated in my master's program. That was my thesis, uh, you know, trying to bring in two very different opposites into, into one single, single work. Um, and to a great extent, that was sort of drawing a parallel with my own life. Uh, because uh, Monday to Friday, I was, you know, had to be politically correct, corporate uh, role. Uh, and, then, and then by the weekend was my entire artistic creative endeavors. Um, so there was harmony and there was discord and all of that coming together in the singular sort of a piece of work. So there's this body of work that I worked on uh, with, with this as the thematic. Uh, and then, and then uh, I created a miniature sort of a series where the biggest work was two and a half inches high. Oh, um, wow, that's small. That's really, really tiny coming from the you know, relatively yeah. larger scale work. And again, it, you know, the reason I created that, the anecdote goes, uh, there was an international show planned in Delhi, a ceramic show. And uh, the way they had put all the artists was literally in the alphabetical order. Uh, so the person behind me uh, was Ray Mika, okay? And uh, American Indian, uh, uh, you know, extremely expressionist, uh, bold work. Uh, R-A-Y, Ray, and then R-A-H. So we were just next to each other. You know, so I got really nervous. And it was an international show with uh, Australian uh, uh, ceramists and others from India. I got nervous. Uh, you know, why would anybody pay at any attention to my work if I'm next to someone like Ray, who's just, you know, going to be presenting such bold works always. Uh, you know, I can't compete on skill, on form, on scale. I thought, you know, he makes really gigantic works. So, uh, well, then I thought to myself, uh, scale doesn't necessarily mean going large. How about, how about I work on scale, but in the reverse direction? You know, and that's exactly when, uh, uh, you know, I decided to make really tiny uh, miniature works. Uh, I titled it Tranquil Flame. Uh, again, you know, the opposites and oxymoron sort of come back because tranquility of a flame, you know, flame and fury, but still very tranquil, uh, peaceful. So uh, I, I glazed them in absolute blood red, glossy glaze. And 10 of them, you know, you literally had to bend down uh, to see the work properly. Uh, and that strategy worked because, uh, you know, while people were really coming and admiring you know, very, very bold works of Ray, uh, but right adjacent, it was at least, at least intriguing. Uh, some thought it was funny, some were intrigued by it, but it got the attention that I desired to really have that tiny work. And, and cool. you know, most of all, uh, Ray was very, very happy and appreciative uh, of, of that body of work. Well, that, when did you make the shift from, which I assume you did, from doing sort of dish objects and pot objects, so to doing other things? Did you first start like twisting the dishes and things, or how did you make a leap? Yes, uh, the the vessel form on the wheel or or off the wheel began, uh, you know, to provide me the canvas of sorts. You know, it gave me the volume to work with, right? I was still, uh, you know, very desirous of retaining the sanctity of a vessel. Uh, and basically, a vessel is something that holds. So as long as it holds, it's a vessel. And I will, I will not break that sanctity, but I will do, uh, you know, things to it. I will either take away from it or add to it or undulate it in a way that I can you know, manipulated to tell, tell a story. So yes, it was, it was a bunch of those things, you know, altering the form itself um, that uh, began to happen, uh, you know, and sometimes in a playful way, sometimes in a very aggressive, bold kind of a way. Uh, but that, that, that is what sort of was the journey then. So, so tell us about one of your recent works. Oh, my recent work is uh, something that I've worked on in 2020 and I'm carrying on, you know, that uh, right now. Uh, it actually started with a, a curated show at Gallery Threshold. Um, it was called Skin. But I, I started to reference, uh, you know, I, I was 
interested and intrigued with the idea of body and city. So, you know, the whole series of body city is something that was, that was interesting to me. And the, uh, and the work is really at, at the same time references both the body and the city in the sense it could be an aerial view of a city where you see lines and grids and patches, but um, you know, it could also mean a magnified view of your muscles and tissues and veins in, in some ways. Uh, you know, so that idea is something that I worked on for this, this uh, you know, set of works. And then I, and then I extended that uh, in 2019, I curated a residency in, uh, in Calcutta and I myself sort of created some works there. Uh, and that's the first time I worked with iron, welded iron. Uh, iron rods. So that idea I took to, uh, you know, the skeletal framework uh, uh, of, of what I created in clay in, with, with iron. So, you know, I came back and continued with, uh, with that work. So the current, uh, current work that I'm, you know, about finishing is in continuation of that idea. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to shift a little now because you're also a writer. And you're an extremely good writer, and you. you run. I believe it's it's yours. You run a what did you say? A blog, a website, an online portal called Stir World. Tell us about Stir World a little bit. Um, as as much as uh, uh, it is mine, but I don't own it and run it at all. Uh, we, uh, you know, it is founded by uh, by Amit Amit Gupta. Uh, he's somebody who's been uh, in the field of design, uh, you know, especially lighting design for many, many years. And he, he founded, uh, you know, the first lighting design company called vis -Vis. And, uh, you know, Stir is his brainchild. He established it. He founded it. And uh, he's, he sort of owns it and runs it. Uh, but yeah, for all practical purposes, we allow him to believe that he owns it and runs it. Uh, <laughs> Uh, we yeah that that's that's how it is and extremely that's like my collaborators allow me to believe that I'm in charge pretty much the same same thing yeah. that's a good parallel anyway he's a, he's an amazing well we have a fantastic team he's an amazing amazing person very very democratic in in his approach and allows for things to happen so uh, you know I'm glad you think that I I own it and run it uh, I'm, I mean he would be he would be very happy to hear that. Uh, but yes, I uh, am the editor for the art section. I curate the art section completely. Uh, anything and everything that goes in it is something that, uh, you know, is, is very carefully seen. And uh, a lot of writers write, uh, uh, you know, there are features writers and other external freelancers who are commissioned to write. Um, and I also uh, write quite often and frequently for stuff. Um, but uh, how did I start it to, uh, uh, you know, get involved with our journalism in the first place? Yeah, Something because you write for other journals as well. You were mentioning before we started recording, you write for what, Verve, Vogue? Uh, I have contributed to Vogue. I have contributed to Take. I have contributed to several other publications. I was the consulting editor for Arts Illustrated for a very long time. I had uh, two columns in it. Um, I'm right now more regularly writing for Mint Lounge uh, and, of course, oh, okay. uh, for Stir World. Uh, but I have a corporate past as well, right? I'm an MBA and uh, I gave that uh, up uh, completely. Well, mainstream corporate roles in 2015 and I landed myself in NDTV to set up an art venture for NDTV. So I, I finished that and gave that up in 2017. So... With that as the background, you know, and uh, being in the corporate world, in, in uh, a strategy consulting side, uh, you know, I had enough of uh, skill to articulate myself and use the language, right? So I wanted to use that and the sensitivity I had being a practitioner and having educated in art. That really led me to uh, explore uh, art journalism, um, and, you know, really take this sort of interim space, uh, as I always say, which is not reportage, uh, reportage of events, and which is also not esoteric writing meant only for art historians. Uh, so I really wanted to take that space in between where there is perspective. It is driven with, uh, you know, knowledge base, but it's easy to understand, uh, you know, by 
people who are uninitiated into the arts. Um, well, I, I have tremendous respect for you because you have so much energy. You know, you really have put your heart and soul into so many things. And what I really like is every time I go to Delhi, which isn't that often, but enough, but it's it certainly has slowed down during the COVID crisis, but it's like every art opening, there is Rahul Kumar. I mean, you make the scene. And I think that's so important because I fault critics and art writers who really don't circulate that much, but then they come in and they'll write about an artist. And it's like, well, you kind of have to get out there and know what's going on. You have to circulate. You know? And if you don't do that, then you're, you're missing a big part of your job. In my absolutely. Opinion, you know? Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. And uh, it, it is important because I mean, otherwise, how do you keep yourself updated and informed of what's happening? Uh, that entire sensitivity will, will fade away. And, uh, and I think that's, I, I completely agree with you. It's a very important part of being a writer anyways, right? You, you just have to be out uh, and constantly train your eye, train your ears to, to see and to, you know, get a sense of what's really happening. But you, but you don't see yourself as a critic. You see yourself more as a journalist who's just reporting on what is going on. Uh, and yes, and that's, that's a very important, uh, that's a very important distinction. And uh, you're absolutely right. I'm not a reporter. I don't think I'm a critic because I do not base my writing heavily on our history, right? Uh, criticism of aesthetics, and that comes from a very personal space. And I, I think that's very journalistic. Uh, yeah, so I am a journalist, I'm an art journalist, not a critic, yeah, and not a reporter. So exactly that sort of space in between is, is what, I, what I think I want to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think what you're doing is very necessary. And it's a, a fine balance to be both an artist and also writing about the art scene, because many people will think that you're being biased in some way you know, toward your art friends or whatever, but I don't see that you really do that. It seems like you have your eyes open to what's going on. Um, you know, and, and uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, there is a, uh, you know, someone said to me, very interesting, you know, uh, people need to, an artist should be written on by a writer of his or her generation, right? Yeah. Uh, they should also be represented by galleries of about the same age, right? And I think that's very important when I heard that. Uh, uh, and I'll tell you who said that. Uh, Mira, Mira Menezes, uh, you know. Ah, uh, okay. She once said that to me and, and it really made a lot of sense. Uh, I guess the understanding I have of the artists that I know in my generation is far greater and far deeper because it's the same sources that have influenced me uh, as an artist, as a writer. It's, it's that environment that is sort of, you know, I'm rooted in and I circulate in that, in that group and I, and I interact when I'm, even when I'm not writing about, about those people, I interact a lot with them, right? So I think that really uh, solidifies and, and um, reinforces uh, the understanding you know, and I think that uh, makes it makes it important to focus on a generation. I will not be able to do justice to, I mean, not age wise, but I guess as you know, the the moderns or the postmoderns as much, uh, you know, as some of the senior writers will, right? Um, and I guess uh, being a journalist, there is absolutely no place to have biases, uh, except my own comfort with a certain certain set of artists uh, you know if you call that a bias then 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 sure but not to say that a work is good or bad uh, because he's a friend and she's not kind of a thing no there's no place for that and i hold editorial responsibility uh, you know in fact uh, pretty much since incept i mean b even before star world was formed right I've, I've been part of the core team so there's absolutely no space for having uh, any biases even when I have, uh, you know, eight features writer, uh, writer who are writing, uh, you know, under my editorial direction, 
um, that's very important. And also you're of an age, you're not too old, you're not too young, so you can kind of like fit in, you know, on both sides, which I think is good. But what you said is true. A lot of the older writers, you know, they're still hung up on the progressives and people they knew and they were friends with when they were young. And it's exactly. kind of like, it's kind of like, oh, come on now, you're almost 70 years old and you're still run talking about these people all the time. Um, there's a whole new generation that has come up. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You know, mid-career artists and emerging artists and artists who have not been heard from yet. And one thing I try to do on this channel, I try to cover all the bases. I try to cover, you know, the young artists who may not have been really heard of so much yet and also some more important people. I don't want to use the word important, but more well-known people. So, sure. yeah, you know, that's what a writer has to do also. Exactly, exactly. And it's, you know, it's a lot of fun. Uh, all of this informs my, my being and my practice. Uh, and the sensitivity of practicing art informs my writing. You know, it's just such a, uh, I mean, art is home in, in all respects. And one feeds off the other very, very seamlessly for me. Uh, you know, it makes it very wholesome. Do you have a clubhouse group? Do you have a clubhouse club? No, I don't actually. I, I, I've been expecting you to form one for some reason. Like really? Akshat Sinha has formed his, yes. Of course, I formed mine. Yeah. I, I don't know. A Stir World Art Club or something like that. Well, that's an idea. Don't give it to Amit. He will get after my life to do it. Don't run with that. Just I'm encouraging my competitors. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of competitors already. Anyway, you know, and this, huh. I think there's room for more. There's so much room for more discussion and deliberation. I think it'll never be never be enough or too crowded. I think. Uh, no, you know. no. I mean, I noticed this. The one of the last clubhouse events I hosted was about when does art go too far, you know? And also, I did another one about art pedagogy with Inder Pramit Roy, and then I noticed that Akshat Sinha did one just very shortly after about, you know, the failings of the educational institution. Education, yes. And it's yeah. like, you know, it sort of furthered the conversation in a nice way. And it, yes. it, it got a little more edgy than our conversation did. Because I think, you know, around Indra Pramit, everybody's a little deferential, you uh -huh. know. Yes. So, yes. Which, you know, is natural. Anyway, this has gone on pretty long, so I think I will say goodbye. So I say my goodbyes, and then you have to wave. So this is Evil O coming to you from Udaipur in Rajasthan. Please like and subscribe. Please follow the Evil O Art Club on Clubhouse. And thank you, Rahul Kumar, for joining. You have to wave now and say goodbye. Thank you so much for having me, uh, Baswo. It was wonderful talking to you. Thank you. It was wonderful talking to you. Bye. Bye.